There's this video about the greatest hole in the world. And if everything is given to the animal, if all resources were just given to the animal, does that mean it's the greatest hole in the world? And I think it's really important for caretakers not to mistake lethargy for relaxation and comfort. So snake in a box, does it look distressed that it can't climb? Does it look distressed that it can't bore out? Probably not. And if we use the wild strictly as our ruler, be like, oh, they would never do that in the wild. That's immediately a bad thing. Increased welfare does not mean you're making the life easier for the animal. Welcome to the Animals at Home Network. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Now we're just going to basically jump right into this episode. If you're familiar with the Animals at Home Network, you know that there are several different shows on the network. There's my show, Animals at Home Podcast. There's Bryce Broom's show, Animals Everywhere. And then we have a few special other episodes, including the roast sessions, which are episodes between Bryce and I, and Round Tables, which is a sort of a panel discussion where I bring on a few guests and we discuss a topic or two. And that is what today's episode is. Today we are discussing assessing wild type behaviors. So we always talk about replicating nature and how important it is to see those wild type behaviors in our captive animals as a judge of welfare. But the question is, is how many of those behaviors do we want? There are behaviors that happen in the wild that we absolutely do not want to see in captivity. For example, we don't want to replicate the fighting of mates in captivity. We don't necessarily want our animals to have an innate fear of humans like they would have in the wild. That would be a very natural and healthy behavior for them to exhibit in the wild, but we don't want them to do that here. So this discussion is all about assessing welfare using those wild behaviors as a template. I am going to let my guests introduce themselves, and I will see you guys on the other end of this very long and thorough episode. I do hope you enjoy it. This is our Christmas special. It's the last episode being released before Christmas. So if you do celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas, and I will catch you guys in the outro. All right. Well, everyone, welcome to the second round table. Thank you very much for joining me today. Hello. Let's Hello. get, uh, let's wrap around our virtual table and just give a quick intro. To, uh, we won't spend too much time because we have a really interesting topic to, dus- to discuss today. So just give your name and then who, what you're associated with online and then uh, and then we'll go through. So let's start with Joseph in my top right. Hi, yeah. Well, as uh, Dylan says, I'm Joseph from um, JTB Reptiles, um, which is the YouTube channel and also the Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. Um, I've been on the podcast twice before now. And uh, just as like to give you some background from what I'm working on. At the minute, I'm building um, a big new enclosure for me day geckos. And I sort of rabbit on about lighting quite a lot. But uh, that's us. Familiar face, familiar voice. And what about Mariah? So my name is Mariah Healy. I'm a reptile husbandry specialist. I run reptophiles.com and it's associated social media. And uh, the goal of reptophiles is to compile an up-to-date database of reptile husbandry information uh, for modern reptile keepers and to uh, progress uh, reptile husbandry as it is in the U.S. as well as around the world. And if you're not familiar with Reptifiles, you may be living under a rock. But if you're not familiar <laughs> with them, go check them out. It's great stuff over there. And TC. I'm TC Houston from uh, Reptile Mountain and Reptile Mountain TV on YouTube. Uh, I breed blue tongue skinks and a few other animals. And my goal is to provide evidence-based practices for my animals, share that with others, as well as um, try to model progressive breeding practices uh, the best I can. Not perfect, but I'm headed in a direction that hopefully will be someday. Yeah. No, I think you are trailblazing in that department for for sure. And Lori. I'm Lori Torini. I'm currently the director of Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary, although we have many species here that aren't just equines. And I also have my own animal training and behavior business, which is Behavior Education LLC. I've been an animal trainer for over 30 years and primarily until three years ago, worked a lot with mammals. And now my focus is on snakes. And I see a huge hole in the snake world as far as behavior and training. And so that's what I'm focusing my work on now. Yeah. And if you haven't seen Lori's stuff, it's really amazing. Some of the training that she's done with these animals, it's really mind blowing. So if you're someone that's not familiar with training snakes, go check out the videos because it's really incredible. So as far as the actual topic we're discussing today, it's an interesting one about, I think I could boil it down to assessing natural behaviors. So the question is, how can we distinguish those natural behaviors that are positive and 
that, that are positive for the animal's welfare from behaviors that have just developed out of pure necessity just by, you know, by virtue of living in the wild, by having to travel far for resources or brumating in the winter. It, it's, it's tough to tell if, those are, if, if we should be following every single behavior on that list in captivity to give them this ultimate welfare that we're seeking. So I'm going to hand this off to TC because I know he spent a lot of time thinking about this. And, and, and you know, before we do that, a trope I often get is, oh, you want to replicate nature, so why don't you throw in some predators and some parasites into your enclosure? And this is a much more sophisticated version of that, sort of the similar topic, but <laughs> obviously we're not in talking about introducing predators, but the, the sort of the theme of that is, is it's a similar sense of it, but not quite the same. So maybe TC, you could take it from there and then we'll just jump into it. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. So yeah, I was trying to figure out because I'm all about the evidence base and I wanted to have measurable answers for people to give them something that they can hold on to. And what I was trying to figure out is how do we add the positives of, of life and the positive inputs into an animal's experience in captivity and know that it's actually positive? Like, how do we know that that is a not one, a waste of time, because that's an argument that a lot of keepers are like, what's the point of that? I see no added benefit. Well, maybe there is added benefit we're not seeing. So how do we capture the added benefit or the output of what the animal's experiencing? And then I wanted to figure out really, where do we go with this, this measurement of, of animal welfare, animal care? And if we add things to the animal's cage, or we add size to the enclosure, or, we, or whatever thing we're doing for the animal, how do we know it's advantageous? We know, obviously, adding a predator, probably not the best idea. We d but we do know that maybe adding more things for their brain could be a good thing. But how much is too much? How much is fluff? I mean, you can only have so much frosting on a cake, but we want to frost the cake. So mm -hmm. knowing how much frosting, and of course, there's going to be some nuance in there, but understanding what is the right amount of frosting is really important for, for me to be able to communicate that to people that I'm talking with and for me to even care for my animals. Because if I'm wasting time and energy on something, that's not beneficial to anybody. Um, but if I'm restricting something that I'm, I'm missing, that isn't what I want either. I want to have something that I can provide to the animal that would be advantageous. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to decipher between not beneficial and truly beneficial. And I really was like, there's this video about the greatest hole in the world. And if everything is given to the animal, if all resources were just given to the animal, does that mean it's the greatest hole in the world? And I, I immediately thought of the, the TV show Wally. Or not TV show, movie Wally. Mm -hmm. It's a cartoon. There's a little robot, and all these people have all the resources they need at the push button, and they're on these little like wheelie carts. And they, one of the dudes, falls out of his chair, and he doesn't have the muscle tone to even get back up in his chair. He's no longer capable of taking care of himself. And I picture that as the greatest hole in the world situation, where we've the animal has lost its capacity to actually live like a norm, like an animal would. And then at the other extreme, uh, we might go to something where it's it's so lavish that we're wasting all kinds of resources and energy that the animal might not even be using. So I want to be able to tick each box for our animals, but I don't want to make boxes that don't exist. And I don't want boxes that are left empty. And that's yeah. how do we get there? That's my question. And it's yeah. about the lived experience of the animal. There is a certain, to a certain extent, there needs to be some complexity and problem solving that must happen in captivity to, to give them some of that wild sense. But I think the fact that a behavior happens in the wild doesn't automatically qualify it as being a good behavior or something that we want in captivity. So maybe Laura, you could take over for a little bit here because I know that you're familiar with this and you have some more ideas about how we can start to qualify or even quantify some of these, these topics. Well, there's a couple of ways. And when I was listening to TC right off the bat, I wanted to clarify that one of the ways that welfare science and um, a lot of the zoo world measures um, positive and negative indicators of welfare is through stress. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a fear-free certified trainer. And they have a term that's called FAS, fear, anxiety, and stress. And the whole goal of fear-free is to reduce fear, anxiety, and stress for animals during um, care behaviors, veterinary care or other care behaviors. And in my 
personal work, I use the term fear, anxiety, and distress because some stress is good. You know, there's you stress and there's distress. And I really try to avoid distress and seeing animals that are distressed. Because if you don't have some stress, the animals aren't going to thrive. And they're not going to learn and they're not going to grow. And so as an indicator of whether we're doing right by our animals or not and providing good welfare, we need to look at are the animals relaxed and comfortable and experiencing some of the good stress, but are we keeping them from being distressed? And how do we determine that? Well, science can determine that to some extent through um, blood work and through hormone testing and through physiological tests to see um, how many stress hormones are being produced. From my point of view, I try to determine that by observing behavior and watching the animal's behavior. Now, sometimes that can be ambiguous. So one of the potential positive output indicators is the animal's behavior. And are they demonstrating species typical behaviors? Are they demonstrating explorative behaviors, play behaviors? Um, high levels of different behavioral diversity. And those things can sometimes be subjective because how do we measure play in reptiles? There's been lots and lots of research done at, on play in species like dogs. And we, we've co-evolved with dogs and live with them every day and we recognize when they're being playful. But would we recognize if a reptile was being playful? We don't even maybe know what that looks like in that species. Um, so, some of the indicators of positive welfare are very, very concrete and black and white, like testing stress hormones. Um, but then some of them, like the behavioral indicators, are more gray because we have to start learning how to determine what behaviors are good for the animals and what behaviors might indicate that they're having poor welfare or that they're distressed. Or is the lack of behavior an indicator of poor or good welfare? And so animals are designed in the wild to have a certain amount of calories that they burn, energy that they use, surviving and reproducing and just living. Well, they don't have to spend all that energy and use their whole time budget on just survival and reproduction under captive management. But it doesn't mean that they still don't have that physiological potential to utilize that energy and that, and that brain power for things. And so what are they going to do instead? You know, are, are they just going to sit there and do nothing? Probably not because they're not designed to do that. Animals are designed to behave. They're designed to move. Whether how little or how much is going to depend on the species. But under captive management, it's very important, obviously, it should be obvious to provide animals with opportunities to exhibit species typical behaviors, things they would do in the wild. But also, should we be providing them with novel experiences to use up some of that excess energy and some of their time budget that they're not having to spend on survival and reproduction? And these are all things to think about that I don't think we as humans have definitive answers for yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And Joe, it looks like you want to jump in. Yeah, I was I was going to say um, before, as, before I say anything else and before we continue with this, I think it's important to point out that you know because there are people who are watching this who will be thinking this already and this is that people seem to think lots of people do think this that reptiles aren't capable of having any sort of enjoyment or understanding or just general what we call higher thoughts now i hate using the terms higher or lower um but i won't that that's why is one for another day we'll just call it higher thoughts and feelings people think that if you stick a snake in a box and it's got all that it needs to survive that that is it doesn't matter whether it have it has everything else um you know as um laurie says about them having evolved to behave in particular ways there are people who think oh well whether it behaves in the way that it's evolved to or not does not matter to the animal um and without being particularly scientific about it um i think it's fairly safe to say that that is not true um for um for, for this is going into what i'll talk more about mm. in a second um but leopard geckos i think provide a good example because leopard geckos um take the brunt of um poor keeping um 
as far as lizards go, probably. Um, you know, the, the more common the reptile is, the worse care on average it's going to get. Which, but in terms of how they are bred on mass, leopard geckos are fairly bad. Um, in terms of being kept in very small enclosures with no lighting at all, just paper towel substrate, maybe a dish of mealworms, um, a water dish, and if they're lucky, a hide as well. Um, now, I made a video recently about um, social interaction in leopard geckos. Um, and before I mention more about that, I do want to point out that um, I've kept leopard geckos for six and a half years. And in that time, I've kept leopard geckos in pretty much every way under the sun. I've kept the first leopard gecko I had was um, plastic plants, a couple of plastic hides, um, paper towels, water dish, bowl of mealworms. That was it. Um, 45 by 30 centimetre enclosure. Then after that, it was a wooden enclosure with no lighting, but the, the bowl of mealworms and the water dish and a, a ceramic heat emitter. Then it was a um, glass tank, heat mat again with an LED this time. Um, and then, then I sort of moved to UVB, but that leopard gecko that had suffered through all of that and was like four years old died at that point. Only reptile I've ever had that's died, by the way. Um, but then after that, it's been bioactive UV lighting, everything, the whole hog until this year, it's been um, group housing as well. Um, and to what I said earlier about um, reptiles not, having some capacity of understanding or not taking any enjoyment or capable of higher thought um, in keeping those keeping that one species that way I can say that 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 they most certainly do have a capacity to behave no we cannot we do not know for certain that they are directly suffering because of them being kept in a particular way but as Laurie says, not being able to perform particular behaviours in and of itself, I think is something that we need to take as a real measurement of inadequacy of care. So, for example, um, when I was talking about the social interaction in leopard geckos, um, somebody said to me, well, leopard geckos, if they're kept on their own, what do they do that illustrates their distress? They don't, they don't go pacing round. You know, they, they don't do the things like, they don't do tigers pacing round in zoos. They don't, they're not like parrots picking the feathers off. So how can you say that that animal is actually suffering from being kept alone? But if there are behaviours which, for example, greeting each other and licking each other's faces or just sh using a shared latrine with each other or literally just knowing of each other's presence, these are things, well, I suppose the last one we can't, but the others, we can see that those behaviours are being performed and we can see that they are definitely not being performed when the animal is alone. So I think that in and of itself needs, needs to be recognised as some measurement of an animal's distress. As, as sort of paradoxical as it seems, because there's just, there's not, what I'm getting at is it's, it's very hard to know what is, what is distress and what is positive behaviour. And that's why we're having this discussion, I suppose. But I think, I think that point of, well, firstly, as I say, it is fairly concrete, I should say, that, anim that reptiles amongst animals are very much capable of these understandings and furthermore that not exhibiting particular behaviors needs to be recognized as an issue so snake in a box does it look distressed that it can't climb does it look distressed that it can't burrow probably not but you're seeing that it's not climbing and not burrowing and i think we need to think of that as an issue in and of itself mm -hmm. well the the uh they are genetically predisposed to, to behave in certain ways, right? That that is what we want. So, the, but then the question comes: what what behaviors do we want, and which ones don't we need? So maybe Mariah, you can jump in. Uh, you don't have to comment on what I just said. I just and then and then maybe we'll go to TC. That is a good point that you made, though, Dylan, um, about what behaviors are 
desirable and what ones aren't desirable, like just real quick addressing that. For me personally, I categorize it as look at the role that they play in their um, in their ecological niche and where they tend to hang out and then facilitate the behaviors that they're most likely to have instincts for. So there's no reason to give a dig box to a crested gecko so that it can dig. Maybe for a female, if you're planning to breed so that you can have a lay area, but if you have a male or a non-reproductive female, there's really not much of a point there. But um, on the other hand, I recently had a conversation with a uh, Roman Murin and it was awesome. Uh, we were talking about um, my red eared slider care guide, which is going to be published very soon and it's going to be done. And I am so relieved because I'm ready to be so done with this project. It's not even funny. But Quickly tell everybody how many pages that care guide is. My gosh. Uh, including the health guide section, which is extensive. Uh, it's 70 pages. And uh, I That's think- That's a book. I think 20,000 words. <laughs> That's amazing. Good for you for doing it's, that. It's the largest I've ever done. And there's a lot of data on them. And they're also very complex reptiles because it's not just land. It's also water. And I had to learn so much for dealing with water in a reptilian sense rather than a freshwater fish sense. Mm -hmm. And there are differences. So uh, there are, there's some things about this care guide that are going to shake up a few preconceptions about keeping red-eared sliders, even among experienced hobbyists, I think. And I'm, I'm expecting a little bit of uh, negative feedback uh, about that, but I think it's for the best. But this conversation that I had with Roman inc included a discussion on the expression of natural behaviors in red-eared sliders. Because they're semi-aquatic, you see them often kept in enclosures where uh, you know, it's just a big tank of water. Hopefully it's big anyway. And a tiny little basking platform where there's a tiny little heat, uh, heat bulb and a tiny little UVB bulb. Uh, the Zilla, uh, kit is a really good example of this where you see overall, it's a pretty good looking kit, honestly. Uh, it's too small and worse you have this itty bitty little UVB bulb included in it. Like the concept is really good, but in terms of actually being useful, it has some work that needs to be done. Uh, when I went back and reevaluated that for updating the kit article I wrote, but Roman was asserting the importance of giving red-eared sliders and other uh, semi-aquatic turtles a land area, more than just a basking platform, but actually something that they can actually have a bit of a walkabout on. And I kept red-eared sliders um, growing up. Uh, that was a family pet for a while. We had the little like quarter-sized ones before they were illegal. And uh, even as a teenager, I had a couple of them. And I, it had never occurred to me to give them a land area that they could walk on because semi-aquatic they spend most of their time swimming you see them in the wild i grew up in minnesota you see painted turtles sunning themselves in ponds and what do you see you never see one in the grass you see one usually on a log okay well how often was i stomping around around ponds okay granted not much so there's one bias of my own personal observations is i'm not seeing them when they're out and about looking for nesting sites or looking for mates in other ponds uh and he was saying you know they've got legs you can see that they're not adapted to strictly uh, being in the water. They can walk on land. And the females, one of the big problems you see with uh, captive female red-eared sliders is egg binding. Egg biting often happens without a suitable lay site. You do see some cases where they will attempt to lay their eggs on their basking platform, or they will even drop them in the water out of sheer desperation. Um, but not providing a area of land with deep diggable substrate sand or soil where the female can sit, think to herself hey yeah that's a that's a good nesting site i feel comfortable depositing my eggs here or even just hey look dirt it's the only dirt i've got i can put my eggs here is something i didn't consider before and considering that males during mating season feel compelled to look for mates and in other ponds, which means leaving the water 
and females during nesting season feel compelled to leave the water and find a nesting site. That's once multiple times a year for the females. That probably justifies including an air an area of actual land as part of the red eared sliders enclosure, mm. more than just a fish tank with a bit of land on it. Um, and I also wanted to address a point that Joe brought up uh, about are we oversimplifying the enclosure as we see with leopard geckos? You know, okay, they have technically everything they need to survive. It's adequate heat, adequate food adequate sub- supplementation and a substrate that makes it very difficult for them to ingest and potentially cause digestive problems there. Technically you're covering your bases, but it's very, very simple. And on the, the other hand, it's, well, we could go further, but what's the harm in going further? As long as it's in the right direction and facilitating the natural behaviors that their instincts are likely to compel them toward, but I, my question for all the people who are like, well, it's not worth it, is, is it though? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, why not err on the side of caution? These are living creatures. I think uh, New Zealand last year passed something uh, acknowledging all animals as sentient beings. Like, that's huge. And what if we treated all of our pets like sentient beings? Like, what's the worst that can happen? We're a better human being for treating an animal well? Like, what, what are, what do we have to lose aside from maybe some more financial output on the animal? And if you're in such a tight finance place financially where you can't do more than the absolute bare minimum to keep it alive, that brings up the question, should you even be having that pet to begin with? Um, so for me, it's just really when people ask, what's the point? my immediate response is why not Hmm. like what do you have to lose and as somebody who tends to oversimplify a lot like it has gotten me in trouble many times it's i know the feeling of wanting to oh it's fine it's fine the way it is like it's working we're good but why not go further if it's only a human inconvenience and actually probably isn't going to harm the animal and actually has the potential to give it a better quality of life again why not so i think this is a good springboard for maybe for tc to jump in as well because so imagine you have this turtle that in the wild spends a lot of time wandering from pond to pond migrating for uh, breeding purposes or maybe even resources so then the question is is that behavior linked to an increased level of welfare and if so then yes we should do it in captivity but maybe in the wild this is just like a horrible experience for this turtle he's like trudging himself through these ponds he's walking across highways so so that's the the question is where how do we pluck those things out so maybe tc you want to jump in on on that and then i know Lori will have something to say and and joseph's chomping at the bit as well so we'll just keep going around (laughs) it's so good (laughs) i'm glad you all got to talk and stuff because then you get my brain working i have to start off and i'm quoting wally from disney (laughs) (laughs) i want to i'm I'm, I'm dead serious i'm watching that movie after this i've seen it before but it's so true so anyway go ahead (laughs) Right, Joe and Mariah is spot on with some, that stuff. And immediately what I sparked it, or what sparked in my head is um, antibiotics. And I know that sounds completely out of the, but why do we give antibiotics and you're supposed to finish the full course, right? To be sure you've covered not just where you've killed off the bacteria problem, but beyond it. So you're supposed like docs give you the full dosage that's beyond because you feel better in like two days, right? So you're all better but you go past it to drive it home. And what Mariah was saying is why would we go to just the the absolute minimum? Why can't we drive past it? Mm -hmm. And in in my hospital, and I work at a psychiatric hospital. And and so we take people's rights, basically. We don't take them, but we restrict them for their own welfare. Um, But when we're talking about providing them with some resources, one of our policies is if it's reasonable, to provide, then our response is to provide it if it's reasonable. And so, of course, then we had to define what was reasonable. And that's one of the questions. Doorbell. I have a doorbell. 
that's okay. I'm not going to get it. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure unless it's Santa, then I'm getting it. Um, uh, the, the, then we define and we had to say, are, is the, you know, are there available resources? So if we have to have four pawns, is that reasonable for a keeper? And then in that question, and when Lori was mentioned earlier before we even began, should we even keep them, right? That's one of the questions, right? Because if mm-hmm. we have to have four pawns, oh man, that's intense, unless you can provide four pawns. But is there a way we can substitute an artificial um, example of the four pawns? Maybe there's a barrier and they walk around the barrier and, oh, it's a new pond. You know, <laughs> they, they, it's the same pond. They just didn't realize it from the other side. And there's more land space that they can go around. We definitely should be, if it's reasonable, I think that that's a re- an, an easy response that we should provide it if it's reasonable to our own means. Uh, Liam, who's on a, this occasionally, was talking about it's a thirty-five dollar UV bulb. Yeah, can't the thirty-five dollar UV bulb? Maybe it's this isn't really the right thing for you, considering the benefits. It's reasonable to provide, and so with that to measure these things. Um, that's what I'm going to start asking myself, at least in my care is, is this, is this reasonable? Is this something I can do? Is this something I, I can't do? And then why is it something I can't do? And is it something that I can alternate or sell, find some alternative to substitute um, with Wally and the, the behaviors and the idea of um, like where the animal is getting some physiological different muscle time and activity when it's moving on land versus just trying to sit on a log or swimming very different physiological motion from walking on land so there's a different actual structure to their bones and the muscle tensions that's going to tone different way much like a snake going out to hunt that snake is now using different their brain they are um engaging in decision and um, I want to clarify uh, the idea. Yes, we do have mammal, mammalian brains typically are complex than a reptiles. It's all based out of the same material. But the, the reptile does have a brain. It's a really, it really is, de, is, it is evolved to experience these things, especially the sensory functions of climbing. If it's an arboreal animal or similar, it's, it's, it's evolved to experience temperature fluctuation um, and it's it's evolved to experience these things and these experiences necessarily where they have a secondary emotion of like joy but they still have the initial primary experience and that is a brain function and the brain needs to function and if it's just like a muscle if your heart's not beating it's not working and your your brain needs that so when someone says the greatest hole in the world why why we don't ever have to do anything for this animal well you're missing out on the correlative other benefits to providing that resource so when you provide that resource the animals like food it's now no longer hunting Mm -hmm. so it needs a substitute because its brain is no longer functioning for that hunt and so then that piece of that physiological neurons in that brain is not being turned on and therefore that organ is not as exercised as it should be. And, and that's where enrichment is so incredibly important and resource provision. So we, I wanted to add, like when we're trying to define what behaviors to allow to limit, like migration, elephants, for example, I was an elephant keeper for a while. You have to work on their foot pads because they're, they've evolved to migrate long, long distances and walk a lot. And so they actually have to come in and we have to like carve out their foot pads because they're not worn down like they would be na- naturally. So a benefit to migration isn't just to get to the water, right? Because there's drought and they need to get to the water and the food. There's also the benefit of wearing down those foot pads or compensating for the the differences in um, other areas of their body or of their lives that would be experiential for this. So the snake with the hunting, all these different things. So when we limit a behavior, I think it's important that we recognize what other things um, or if we're providing a resource that the animal doesn't have to exhibit a behavior for, what other things are we then removing, like the turtle and the, the tone of a body walking on land or the elephant with its foot pad or a snake hunting? Because um, now that neuron is no longer firing. 
And if it's no longer firing, and there's research out there that shows snakes that don't have problem solving and don't have these activities are less healthy. Mm -hmm. And it's literally measured by longevity, I believe. They actually live longer, if I'm correct, in this research. I have to go back and look. I could be completely wrong. Someone will smack me for it, I know. But (laughs) But I think it's, do you remember it? Like there was something that was long. I I, I know what you're on about, but I can't remember. I swear there was some measurable difference between the two animals. And it wasn't just that they were better at problem solving. There was an an added physiological benefit. It's because the brain's a real organ that has to be functioning. It has to be used. There was, there was definitely one where they were grown in one was in, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was black rat snakes yeah. and there was enriched it, enclosures and not, and the black, the ones that were in it enriched grew longer as well as more. They had more weight at the end. I think that, yeah. So there was like a real physiological thing to it. Um, yeah, exactly. That's the one. I think it was about rat snakes. And the concept is that we can't just take one thing and say, okay, now we've provided them with food why would they need to do anything? Yeah. They need the hunting experience for their f- brain organ health and, and and their welfare in that case. And so when we limit something, I want to make sure we're not limiting too much. And what are we identifying is what we've lost. Does that make sense? It, it makes total elephants? sense. And oh. I think it's really important to drive home the point that it equ- increased welfare does not mean you're making the life easier for the animal. In some cases, it's actually the opposite. We're making the life more challenging for that individual. And so, sort of a, a human example is like you have a kid who you know grows up, has to work for some things, you know, studies really hard to make school, to, to, to make college and whatnot. And then you have a kid who's a spoiled brat who lives maybe with a rich family and they get everything they want. Now, at the end of the day, 25 years later, typically the better integrated person into society is the person who had to work and learn and had challenges. And that person actually probably has an increased welfare based off all that. So, so that is really important to understand that the greatest hole in the world theory is the opposite of welfare because you're making everything way too easy. So Lori, maybe you want to jump in on that. Yeah, I wrote down some notes as everyone was talking. And so I guess I'll start first with kind of the last thing TC was talking about, which was the animal's brain and not being able to use it to the extent under captive management that they would in the wild. And I think it's really important for caretakers not to mistake lethargy for relaxation and comfort. Mm. So oftentimes, especially with reptiles, I see learned helplessness and I see them being lethargic. That is not the same thing as being comfortable and relaxed. Those are two very different things. So when animals aren't able to perform species typical behaviors or when they aren't able to expend energy, whether that's physical energy or mental energy on novel things under captive management, you know, they can go one of two directions. They can start exhibiting stereotypies within the enclosure, which would be the glass pacing, the edging, the nose rubbing, some of the other things that we see in reptiles, or they can just give up and become lethargic and sit there and do nothing. And um, that's also term learned help. It can be learned helplessness. So we don't want to mistake that behavior for, oh, the animal's relaxed and content because it's just sitting there. Mm. Um, One of the other things that came up was the muscle development. And the brain's a muscle, so I I definitely feel it's important that we give them mental stimulation. But I've also taken in snakes here that have had a very flaccid body. You know, you pick them, they just feel soft and kind of, you can tell they don't have good muscular development. And then after they've been here a few weeks and they've been allowed to free roam in some of our exercise areas, and I pick them up, it's almost frightening when you feel how strong they are and how solid they feel. I'm like, wow, I'm glad this snake is tame and it's not out to get me because it could really hurt me how strong it is right now. And it's a night and day difference when they're allowed to get that physical exercise. And I don't know how to measure play behavior in reptiles, especially snakes, but you know, I've had a snake, our um, dryer went out and I put a clothesline up to dry clothes until we got a new dryer. One of the snakes left the exercise area one night And he climbed back and forth across this clothesline like six times. And it was frightening because this was a Bradley and they're pretty thick. He's about a six foot Morelia Bradley. 
And I thought, why is he doing that? I thought maybe he was just using it as a means to get somewhere else, but he kept going back and forth. And so was he doing that just to expend energy? Was he doing it for physical exercise? I could see his body muscles like shaking, trying to not fall off the clothesline. And I'm walking beside him in case he does fall and he didn't fall. And so why are they doing these behaviors when we give them the opportunity? Is it because males roam more in the wild looking for females? Is it because they, in, they find it reinforcing to expend that physical energy? Was that mentally stimulating for him? I don't always know the why, but when I see an animal choosing to do a behavior, I allow them to do that behavior more because they are choosing to do that. It didn't hurt me to let him go back and forth across the clothesline. And that brings me to something that both Mariah and TC alluded to, which was if it it's not hurting to give the animal more. Mm -hmm. So why would you just not do that? We work with a lot of snake species here and every single one of them has a humid hide with damp sphagnum moss inside species that people think don't need a lot of water or humidity or anything. I give every snake one because why not? It doesn't hurt me to go to the dollar store and buy a container and cut a hole in it and put sphagnum moss in it. And every single snake that we have here, which are, which is a lot, you had uses their humid hides, even species that you're told don't need that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't hurt me at all to throw one in every enclosure. Like, how does that put me out? It doesn't. And I'm going to always assume um, that reptiles have high cognition and experience emotions until that's proven otherwise, because it doesn't hurt me to do that. But if I assume they don't have feelings, they don't have emotions, they don't have higher cognition, and I treat them like property, and then we find out later that they do experience emotions, I'm going to feel horribly bad because I didn't treat them right. So it doesn't hurt us to treat them well. I mean, how does that put us out? And if that does put you out, then maybe you shouldn't have a living animal that you're caring for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very well said. Very, I totally agree, and I think we all are in the same boat there. It is... It, it is fascinating in that sense where quite often we are the ones, and I've said this before, that we are the ones that are burdened to provide the evidence to increase welfare when it really ought to be the other way around where the people that are keeping them in very unenriched, sterile conditions, you guys have deviated as far as possible from the wild. How come it's us that has to prove that enrichment and some natural replication behaviors is important for the animals? It's kind of bizarre that way. So Joe, maybe you want to jump in. Yeah, I uh, I wanna I wanna give a couple of bearded dragon anecdotes now. Step away from the leopard geckos from earlier, and this is because I can think about things with my own bearded dragon that applies to pretty much what everybody said. So the first thing that that I was thinking of with the the what Mariah was saying about why not provide things is earlier this year I added some branches to my bearded dragon's enclosure, which is sort of you know coat cam diameter. Uh, because that's large enough for him to climb on. Now, I was sort of doing that in the knowledge that bearded dragons in the wild are semi-arboreal animals, not just running around on the ground. And the branches and twigs I had in there were way too small for an adult bearded dragon to climb on. Now, previous to having the larger branches in his enclosure, he would always sleep, um, either just slumped out over a piece of cork bark, or more usually, he would dig down into his substrate and sleep underneath something. But since adding those branches in, in July, I want to say, um, every single night is uh, slept at the highest point on the highest branch. Every single night is not once buried himself anymore, always climbed. Um, so much so that he actually went into brumation um, at the top of the branch until uh, I thought that was like a little bit odd. So I was going to try and move him into a burrow, but uh, he hissed at me and told me to go away. So I, I just left him. <laughs> um, he knows what he's but, doing. Yeah, he does. He, uh, he doesn't need me to ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that is like just such an obvious thing. You've given the animal the opportunity to express the natural behavior, which is climbing, and it takes it daily predictably now a branch as it happens i did actually buy those branches because being quite thick i couldn't get them without like getting a hacksaw out and upsetting the neighbors so i actually actually shelled out and bought them uh, but if i had picked up those branches and they were completely free completely free now my bearded dragon's enclosure is only two feet tall 
I wish it was taller, but that's just like a bog standard size, two feet. Now, if you went outside and there were you you collected a big branch, and there is like I have evidence, I've you know video recordings that my animal will take that opportunity. Are you going to come back to me and argue that it is better that you don't put the branch in because the animal doesn't need it? You just wouldn't. And to that end. Why would you argue that a UV lamp is not is not required? Because let's imagine that UV lamps were free. UVs like just such an easy thing to know that we should be providing it. Because unlike the rest of the things we've spoken about, the benefit of UVB is measurable in terms of D three production. We we have a quantifiable factor there we can measure the you know something that tells us about the vitamin d3 production so we know for a fact we have a quantifiably we know that it brings a benefit so if it were to be free and you didn't spend any money on it you could just do like you did with a branch and you walk outside and you collect it why would you not provide it to that animal what is the argument for not giving it to them if it's set up appropriately you know you're not sticking it like on the floor of the enclosure or something so it's staring right at the bulb or anything daft like that and mm-hmm. um, you know i don't see that there is an argument there at all for not providing it and now um shifting slightly to what um tc was saying about the elephants and the wearing down of the feet is that with um the bearded dragon, for example, climbing the branches. If you don't provide that branch, then is there is there actually something we could measure there? If the animal can't climb, will it have reduced muscle tone? Will it be like Laurie says with the snake? Will it be relatively flaccid? You know, that that potentially there is something we, we could measure there. Again, whether whether what, what we decide good and what we decide bad is is not exactly quantifiable, I suppose, but I think we've we, we can all everybody listening here can sort of agree that an animal which is has no muscle tone whatsoever is not good, and an animal which is fit and strong is good. So there's that. Um and then also thinking still about bearded dragons and um being able to exhibit natural behaviors is hunting. Um so hunting is something which is quite difficult to do in captivity because in a five by two by two foot enclosure, um, it's not really enough space for many insects to hide where a bearded dragon's not just going to get them because bearded dragons are snipers, aren't they? Um, but I, I do something which most people don't say not to do. And that is that I do let crickets just live in his enclosure. Um, and they seem to do really well in the enclosure, actually. They do better in the enclosure than in the little cricket keeper I have them in, which may or may not be to do with the ultraviolet and the, all the sunlight radiation in there, but we won't go into that one because that's insects and not reptiles. <laughs> um, but I do see in, like, the the, the hunting behaviour of bearded dragons, it's, it is fantastic just to, you know, purely selfishly to watch. Um, now... People will be familiar with um, geckos tail wagging. So leopard geckos, for example, when they get excited when they see prey, they like raise the tail up over the back and start wiggling it like that because they get all let up. But I have seen my bearded dragon um, tail lash. I didn't know bearded dragons did this. I'd never heard of it. But there was one time I saw um, he was sort of up after lights off, actually, which is weird because usually he's sleeping. But there was a cricket and he saw it. And uh, it was like it was a like a couple of inches in front of him, but crickets are the one insect which are fast enough um, to escape a bearded dragon, really, that we've got. And he was there and he was watching it and then the, the tail, like it, just like a cat, just starts twitching and then he'll bolt forwards and got it. But I, I see him like staring at these crickets, like, you know, trying to get them. And most of the time he misses, but, but then occasionally he does. Now, if I didn't leave crickets running around in the enclosure, would I be able to say anything at all that that animal was suffering? What does even distressed at all? Does a bearded dragon which can't, which doesn't get to exhibit those behaviours, look distressed? No, absolutely not. If it can't climb, 
does it look distressed? No. If, you know, if you don't give a snake UV exposure, does it look distressed? No. But let's say that all of these things were free. We really should err on the side of caution in allowing the animals to perform these behaviours because aside from your money, what's to lose? Yeah. Yeah, it's that idea where when you add something that it would have in its natural environment, these animals automatically do what they would do if they had that exposure in the wild. It's really bizarre. And the story I told last week on the podcast that it's not out yet for you guys, but I added a very large pond to my Brazilian rainbow boa enclosure. And for the first time I fed her in the enclosure and then immediately after she ate the rat, she plunged herself into the pond. The pond is very deep, so it's, it almost acts like a hide for her. And she spent, you know, probably 24 hours in there. And then she went through shed last week and she spent literally seven days in the pond. She did not leave it. I was completely blown away. She came out, she shed, now she's back in her human hide. These are behaviors that I would never have seen unless I had the pond. And it, you, 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 it's almost like Lori was saying earlier, you almost feel guilty about it now. It's like, oh, I didn't have this. I've had her for five years. She's never had that opportunity. And as soon as it was there for her, she did it. And she, she behaved in the way that she probably would in the wild. So that, that's just one point. So maybe Mariah, you want to jump in. Yeah. Okay. So I help moderate uh, Bearded Dragons Network and when you deal with a lot of people keeping uh, bearded dragons or any other commonly kept reptile, you get variations in their behavior and you see people posting about it all the time. My bearded dragon is doing X. Is that a good or bad thing? And if we use the wild strictly as our ruler and be like, Oh, they would never do that in the wild. That's immediately a bad thing. Okay. But our reptiles may not be domesticated, depending on your definition of domesticated, and we won't go there. But they, but their environment is different from the environment that they are subjected to in the wild. Like, Joe, your bearded dragon, sleeping in a tree would get it killed, probably. A bird would be like, hey, bearded dragon on a stick, you know, mm-hmm. but in the captivity, there's no danger to that. So what's to tell the bearded dragon not to do it? It finds it pleasurable, obviously. So sleep in the branch it is. And I have wondered about that, you know. So, sorry to butt in. I was only thinking, because no. I, I did consider why he would like to um, sleep up a branch. And it has, I was sort of thinking, well, if it's down a burrow, and like thinking before, like they got wiped out from the country or whatever, if a Tasmanian devil or a thylacine comes to a bearded dragon down a burrow, it can't go anywhere. Or if a large, if like a blackhead python or something comes to it, it's snookered. But at least in a tree, it can fall out the tree and run. That's the o- that's the only thought I've had about it. But what was on. that word you just used? Snookered. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> All right, I've never oh, heard that slang before. Is is that not, is that like not outside of Britain or something? I have never heard or read that word in my life. <laughs> Okay. Uh, awesome. Al- alternative word. In fact, no, I'll leave it for the viewers. Somebody can Google it. Leave it in the comments. <laughs> All right. Mystery <laughs> of the go. day. Anyway, so keeping <laughs> going on that point is, so we need to make room for one individual variation. Just because one bearded dragon likes to sleep up in a tree does not necessarily mean that another. Like I, my bearded dragons, um, one had a heart condition. She was not interested in climbing. <laughs> Uh, period. Uh, the other one really loved to climb, but did she ever sleep up there? Not at night, not during brumation. She was very much a likes to be down in the burrow. Um, but even like the one with the heart condition, she likes to prop herself up um, and be kind of uh, diagonal when she basked or when she was just resting. And it may have had, it may have helped a little bit with blood flow or, or helped her breathe a little bit easier or something. I don't know. But I had to adjust her enclosure to her particular preferences and needs. So her basking area actually had rocks that she could haul herself up onto to get into that comfortable diagonal position. And she would use that frequently. Mm. Um, Other things like uh, bearded dragons sleeping in their water bowl. They, why would they sleep in a body of water? They, it's been proven they can't absorb water through their vent. That's not a hydration thing. It might help a little bit with shedding, uh, hydrating the skin a little, but 
yet you see when bearded dragons have uh, a water bowl that's large enough for them to be in, sometimes they sleep in it. And I don't know, maybe that cools their body down at night and helps them achieve a more restful sleep. Is it going to harm them? I mean, as long as humidity levels are within range in the enclosure and they can tolerate much higher humidity levels than we think they can, as long as they have a place to dry off and get warm, maybe some bearded dragons just like to sleep in the hot tub. Also, bearded dragons who like to swim. Okay, they're not semi-aquatic. Not at all. And yet you see a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, I give my bearded dragon a bath, even though I know it's not a hydration thing. It likes to swim. I'll put it in a kiddie pool out in the summer and it'll just swim around and have the time of its life. It doesn't try to escape from the pool, even though it has the option. It just really enjoys swimming. And you know, after it's done, it'll be like, all right, I'm out, haul itself out. But there's individual variation for these animals that are not concerned with staying alive. They have food provided to them. They're not trying to escape from predators all the time. And so they have this gap where they've got this energy to expend. And okay, they spend it doing things that bring them some kind of pleasure. Just like Lori was saying with the snake going back and forth on the clothing, on the clothing line. That's amazing. They're doing things that they find for one reason or another fulfilling or even possibly we could use the word fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and on that note, uh, I find... I guess going on about behavior and what baby behaviors are necessary to f- facilitate, I had a thought uh, about the difference of experience that I've had observing my wild caught animals and my captive bred ones. And I, and I found and I've observed uh, from what other people have said about keeping wild caught animals, especially species that are difficult to keep alive in captivity you need to be very careful about the behaviors that you facilitate uh, for a wild caught animal. It could literally be the difference between life and death for these individuals because they go from wild where they can express these behaviors to conditions where all of a sudden they're very restricted. And if they can't express certain behaviors, it can actually kill them. Sometimes it's just failure to thrive. Sometimes it's because, you know, the husbandry parameters were off. But you see very experienced, very knowledgeable people keeping species and trying their darndest to keep these wild-caught animals alive. And nothing clicks until they find one behavior, one thing to throw into their enclosure that changes the whole game for them. Um, And I find, and I wonder if it has something to do with uh, will to live, so to Mm. speak giving them things to do, giving them things that they're used to and comfortable with. And you go from a lump that has nothing to do to a living creature that is able to have a fulfilled life where it's actually doing things during the day and it's motivated. Uh, I mean, with COVID being right, uh, (laughs) being raging uh, through the U S right now, it's, we're spending a lot of time at home again and The weather is getting colder um, in many states and we're not just at home or alone. We're stuck in our houses. And if you don't have enough to do, if you don't have enough stimulation, I mean, we're seeing mental health issues back on the rise. It's we're in granted a very stressful time, but the isolation as social creatures, that's a very big part of our natural behavior. We're not able to express that very well. And so you see people's mental health, so to speak, their will to live tank. And I feel like that is our experiences here during quarantine and social distancing should really give us some insight into how our reptiles might be feeling in their own enclosures and taking our experiences and reflecting them in a species appropriate way on them. Um, And last thing on the hunting in the enclosure note, I find this hilarious that this is even, I guess, debated Yeah, okay, there's the ingestion of loose substrate thing, which is a concern. If you have the right substrate and the parameters are right, we've already established loose substrate is not a problem. I mean, okay, bark chips versus dirt, there's a preference there. But ingesting a little bit of dirt with your food is not going to kill you. It's actually probably going to be good for you. So, yeah, 10 seconds. Exactly. Going back, some species, you have to feed them in their enclosure. You dump the bugs into the enclosure and you let them hunt. Other species, it is not considered acceptable 
to do that. Why? As far as I can tell, the only difference is one has been kept a lot in the hobby and has developed its own little subculture of what's appropriate and what's not acceptable to do with the animal. And the others are rarer or you don't have an option. Like morning geckos, for example. Are you going to try tong feeding a morning gecko? Like, okay, you can do that for training exercises. Like, that's fun. But I have a colony of lost count of morning geckos. And I can't feed them all individually by tongs. I can't keep fruit flies in a bowl. Are you kidding me? They climb right out. So I just have to dump the fruit flies or the crickets, whatever, in their enclosure. And then I get to have the fun of watching them chase these things down all over their enclosure. They're tail wagging. They're chirping at each other. Hey, this is my bug. Back off. Mm -hmm. They're they're competing with each other in a positive ways. They're all over the place. It's the best time of their week when it's bug day. And the same thing goes for... Um, my leaf-tailed gecko, she's learning how to tong feed. Awesome. That means that she's more comfortable with me. I mean, she's a wild-caught specimen, but she has taken to captivity so well. She's amazing. And the fact that she's comfortable with me, with my big eyes, you know, up in her face, being like, hey, what you doing? It doesn't phase her. I opened the enclosure up for misting, and she's like, okay, stop raining on me, and she'll go find a leaf to hide under but she's never afraid of me. And yet it's better for her and easier for me to just dump the bugs in there. And then she chases them. And instead of getting food for, you know, five minutes a day or whatever, she gets to hunt her food as she feels hungry mm -hmm. and when the opportunity presents itself. So it keeps her busy. She's always, oh gosh, she's always og ogling the isopods in her enclosure. That's her main thing is hunting for isopods. And it's actually becoming somewhat of a problem, but <laughs> it's great for her calcium sacs. Uh, and so it's, that's the other thing is keeping them busy. When you dump the bugs in their enclosure, when you give them opportunities, even for herbivores to put edible plants in the enclosure for them to forage from on their own, that's something that occupies them a lot in the wild is just the pursuit of food. Food for them is a lot more available in captivity, even if we do allow them to hunt for it, but it keeps them busier and more engaged when we give them the responsibility for sourcing their own food when we provide it than simply being, okay, it's feeding time. You've got five minutes, go. Yeah. Yeah, I think the A, the black and white issue is a really important thing is that not every specimen or not every individual is the same. And I, I do it's something that I really try to nail down with keepers is that we typically keep reptiles because we want, and this is what Mariah is touching on, we want a project that we can tinker with. We want to push our skill set. We need that problem solving. That's part of who we are as our DNA. If we utilize our reptiles to that end, we at least owe that to them. We at least owe that same behaviors and same opportunities for them to exhibit the same sort of things that they want to. We want to tinker with our hands. We want to problem solve we should be offering them that exact same thing. And obviously it doesn't look the same for a human and a reptile, but problem solving is the same. So maybe TC, you want to jump in? Yeah. Oh, I, I love what everyone's been saying. It's really, really good. And I uh, wanted to uh, for, comment first on what Mariah had said and Joe, and then I'll kind of circle back to what Joe was asking about, like the, what's the, what's the negative of not putting the branch in, but I want to, which I'm not going to advocate for not putting branch in, but I want to give a breeder's perspective from someone who has a large collection and what that literally what the thought process is when, when that something new, bigger and like better comes out and how I, I like mentally respond to it and what I'm thinking about with my own collection and already wall to wall reptiles. What do I do? That kind of thing. Um, but, but from Mariah's point, absolutely with the, the feeding and Joe with the tail wiggling, it's the individual, that, that was stressed. One of the biggest things I learned as a zookeeper long before welfare science really became a thing. So um, it was individual tailoring of care to a particular animal. Um, in fact, that's one of the most important things that we were supposed to do as a keeper was, was not just feed them, keep the cage clean, make sure the glass is pretty for the public, but literally observe the animals. In fact, when we had interns, we, we would sit them in front and they would, their job was to spend the whole day watching the animal and mark where the animal went literally. And they'd be like that. 
<laughs> oh man well until you get like a gila that sleeps for eight hours and you're just like it didn't move <laughs> oh, <damn. laughs> although, <laughs> 8 15 sleeping 9 15 <laughs> sleeping <laughs> yeah um but the, i mean the evening is very active but uh watching the animal because observing individual behaviors can then give you a tell on what could be tailored to enhance their their care what could be an uh, a reason for some sort of stereotypy uh, the, the, the behaviors where the animal elephants are rocking their heads and things like that. Like, why are they doing this? Okay. What's the problem? Um, individual care is absolutely essential. If you're, if you're not paying, I have individually tailored enclosures and locations for my breeder skinks, even though everything looks the same is not some have more plants because that animal is more, uh, fearful of an overhead, any movement. And so we have more plants so they can feel more secure in that, in that environment and other animals, they prefer to have uh, be on top of their plants. So we've kind of gotten lower, uh, lower plants so they can squish them and sit up top. There's tailoring is really important for an individual. So yes, absolutely. Um, from a breeder's perspective, when we say like, why not add that, that uh, branch or why not have UV? Well, I lived in that world for a while and I've moved from it. Um, based on evidence, because I'm always about the evidence and when we can measure it and stuff like that. And I'm not a disagreeing with not putting the branch and I'm fully on for getting the branch. Um, but what goes through my mind is I'm going to need a bigger enclosure or I'm going to do need more time. Like if I've already extended myself to full capacity of my energy budget as a keeper for my animals and something new comes in that's going to require more energy, I have to find a, a way to balance that budget. And for a keeper that has, so uh, for example, if there was science that came out that said blue tongue lizards, measurable, they're more stressed factually in such size of a closure, they have to have this side or they're gonna all die or they're all stressed, right? So we'd measure that. If there was a real thing that could show that and I could identify it, and I already have had that with previous and I've moved upgraded, but what happened was I lost animals. And so as a breeder, like why would that, that would bother me. I love my babies, right? No, they're not scaly babies, I don't call them that, but <laughs> they're my animals, right? I do love each individual animal. And the idea of having to downsize my collection in order to increase welfare, causes a little bit of anxiety for me. And it did. I went through a super loss. Um, and I think a lot of our hobby um, is given a, a, a misguided perception of what's acceptable. And then they grow to capacity in that six acceptableness. Mm -hmm. That's not a word, but we'll use it. And then uh, new things come along. They have this desire. And now they have this rub between... Uh, losing an animal and increasing some's welfare. And then where does that animal go? I shared that with Dylan and, and Raya a, lot, a couple, I think it was a month or so ago, maybe two months ago um, about how I was struggling because I'm having to downsize some of my snakes because I'm getting everything out of racks and moving all of my reptiles to UV. And in order to do that, like, yeah, you can keep a big giant if you have more space, but there's like physics in my room that's saying that wall ain't moving. Mm -hmm. And so that stresses me for as a prey, as a keeper. And I do this for me and the animals, but we are doing it for us. So when a commercial breeder, I'm picturing like rows and rows of, you know, V70 tubs and ball pythons. And we're saying they're semi-boreal, which they are. Um, and then we're saying that behavior is relatively essential to their health to be able to climb um, for their phys physical health, their mental well-being. And then that means they're going to have to downsize in droves and lots of, not just money. It's not just not, we always go to all, oh, they're going to lose their money and their income. Yeah. I'm sure that's definitely a factor. I'm not going to deny that. But if you just aren't breeding for money at all, say you give it away and it's just for pleasure, you're looking at a loss of your, your, your animals, like, it's like cutting off part of your children and for some people. And that can be distressing. So there is this rub. And I, I, I want us to be able to find a way to give the measurable data that says this is necessary and then find that way forward for people to find a place where they can be comfortable trickling down in their size if they have to, to increase in care. And typically that's going to be cage size 
obviously with UV, you have to have at least certain height or you're going to fry the animal. Um, you, you have to have some for environmental enrichment. You have to have an environment space for that enrichment. Um, so the, that's the, that would be my answer, Joe, is not that it's um, bad at all. It's just it's, sometimes it's a rub. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's a really good perspective to put on it as well. And I, I think, and maybe this is something Lori can touch on, is we have that want to have the hard scientific evidence, but it starts in the soft science form, right? So it's like we want to take that soft observations that we're seeing and, and mold it into something that we can say is hard. And of course, when we're talking about hard scientific data, we need people to be doing these studies and whatnot. So Lori, as far as as far as that transition goes, does everything kind of start in that soft science domain and then work its way towards because we're not going to get studies on everything so what do we do about that yeah absolutely it starts with something that you observe in the animal and just an intuitive feeling that you have so i see the snake pushing on the door and rubbing on the glass well i think he wants out the snake wants out but how do i really know that how do i know that the temperature in the enclosure just isn't too hot? Or how do I know that they just don't want the door open so that there's a fresh input of air? In order to test that, I think the snake wants out, I now have to open the door and sit back and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Does the snake come out? Does the snake sit on the threshold? Does the snake go back into the enclosure and hide? So you start with something kind of intuitive, you know. That Can I pause you for just one second there? Because the, the concept yeah. of the snake sitting on the threshold is something I've seen in my animals. And it's so weird. You see them and it <laughs> looks like they want out. You open the door and then they sit there. I'm like, well, what the, what do you, like, there's almost yeah. no difference between this and that. So do you have any speculation on what that is? Is it is it fresh air or is there something more going on there? I speculate, depending on the type of enclosure you have, they may have a better view of the environment mm -hmm. from that angle than when the door is closed. But I have some that do that and are in glass enclosures. And I think that it has to do with when the doors open, they now have the choice. They can they know that they can come out if they want to. And when you close that door, they're uncomfortable because now they know they can't get out. And so that just all goes back to options and choices and offering those things. And any time that you are offered options and choices and are free to do things because you decide to do them, you're going to have better welfare and be less distressed than if I am forcing you against your will to do something. Mm -hmm. And I can force you against your will to stay in the enclosure or I could force you against your will to come out. And either one of thi those things could be stressful. So it is important that we individualize how we treat each animal and their care. And what is stressful for one animal may not be stressful for another. And I don't see enough people in the reptile hobby trying to build resiliency in their animals. I hear a lot of never do this with your snake. It'll stress them. Well, how about teaching your snake to not be stressed by that event? Because what's it's, it's all well and good if you can keep that snake for life and no disaster ever happens in your keeping. The enclosure never gets broken. You never have to evacuate. The animal never has to be rehomed or go to the vet. All of these things that could happen. Why would you not want to prepare your animal to deal with those possibilities and cope with them in the best way possible? You know, if you only ever expose your animal to their enclosure and only ever feed them in there and only ever do these black and white things and your animal has to experience a change, it is going to be stressed. But if you build behavioral diversity in your animal and start building that resiliency and getting them used to different environments, living in different environments, eating in different environments, being handled in different ways, not all at once, not like you have to learn all this and be okay with it by tomorrow, but over the months and years that you have that animal, if you slowly desensitize them to these different things, like I have many of my snakes will eat wherever, they don't care. They'll eat in the enclosure, on top of the enclosure, out of the enclosure, it doesn't matter. Do I have a few that are outside of that realm? Yes. You're always going to have some individuals that are going to be stressed about certain things because they just have innately less resiliency than others. Um, but I think it's really important that instead of trying to shield our reptiles from these things, oh, that'll stress them, never do that, that we should be trying to build resiliency in them. So if they experience changes, they're not stressed by it. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to point out, because Mariah talked a little bit about wild-caught animals versus captive bred and raised animals, and how you 
care for them differently, or you might train them differently, that it's also important to realize that family animals that are going to live and be part of your family as a pet or family member, you're going to foster different behaviors in them and train them differently and care for them differently than if you're raising animals um, for conservation that are going to be re-released out into the wild. That's going to be much different. And I've had people who've contacted me with um, overreactive feeding responses and say, you know, how do I calm the feeding response in my animal? And you'll get somebody else that will say, why would I want to calm the feeding response? I want my animal to eat. Like, like I want them to strike at everything because I don't want them to stop eating. Well, teaching the animal to have a calm feeding response when they're going to be a family pet is a prudent thing to do. Because if that, if that family pet's going to be handled by you or by children or around visitors, you don't want an animal that's going to strike at everything or try to eat everything. You want them to assess, is this food or not? Oh, I have evaluated it. It's food. Okay, I'll eat it. You want to calm the feeding response. And that may not be the case for animals that you're going to re-release in the wild, but you want to raise them very differently. And the animal's not going to stop eating because it checks first to see if something's actually food or not. I guarantee they're still going to eat, even if you calm their feeding response. Hmm. Um, and one of the, a couple of the other things that I wanted to address that TC mentioned um, was the, the amount of area that some animals traveled in the wild and how can we replicate that under captive management. And, you know, horses are a great example. They travel 20 miles a day when they're in a wild environment, but yet we keep them in an acre or we keep them in a half acre paddock. And there are systems for equids out there called paddock paradises and interactive corral systems. And there's no reason why you can't take those concepts and give them to reptiles. And it's where you provide the water and the food at like two different locations or the burrowing area or the area where the animal is going to roll in a different location from other resources. So you spread the resources out within the habitat that you do have to make them move around instead of just putting everything in one sp spot where they can just sit there and have access to it all without moving. And then Joe mentioned that you're not going to notice an animal distressed if you don't give them UVB. And that is true if they've never had it. There was a study in 2017 about taking away enrichment and that once an animal's had something, and gotten used to it and you take it away, that's worse than them never having had it in the first place. And so one of the, um, I've been doing some little studies with UVB just to watch how it changes behavior. And I have a Darwin carpet python who since he's had UVB, if that light doesn't come on, like when it's supposed to, he's up there going wild, like pacing the light and pushing on the fixture and he's exhibiting all of this behavior that I never saw before he had access to the UVB. And as soon as the light is turned on, he gets underneath it on his perch and relaxes and stretches out. And so he does exhibit what I would term as distressful behavior when that light doesn't come on when he expects it to. But I, I never saw that behavior before he had it, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that, oh yeah, do were you jumping in TC? Yeah, I was going to ask, um, as far as like when we're the, that course that you shared with us, the welfare science, they talked about, um, acute stress versus chronic stress. And when that transitions and then the idea of like, um, not being able to basically change your environment or get away from the stressor or manipulate the stressor to relieve the stress. And I was thinking in the case of your, Python trying to change the light. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how many pythons does it take to change the light bulb? But um, <laughs> uh, the question, what like, so when we're trying to assess behaviors and providing resources and things, and like we're trying to get this, you know, answer the question at the beginning, where do what what would you expect to see if it go? Because that sounds like acute stress in a, in a small a small amount of acute distress. What would you expect to see? when that animal goes to the chronic, because we can kind of, it sounds like in welfare science that in acute stress, ideally you don't want it much, but some is okay, especially if yes. it's like combative or competition, because that can provide healthy stuff. But mm -hmm. like, 
when, what would be the transition? Say that light never came back on. What would you, what would be a key indicator that, okay, now we've got a problem. Does that make sense? We've already got the, that's what I'm trying to ask. Like how would a keeper look at that and then apply change? Does that make sense? So acute, acute stress for all organisms is normal. I mean, we're equipped to deal with acute stress. Something happens unexpected, or the stress response kicks in, and our body's physiologically able to deal with that. The stress goes away, and we go back to homeostasis. So we're all designed to deal with that, and it's normal. But when stress becomes chronic, things that you'll see are reduced activity. You might see a heightened, heightened activity level at first, sort of um, an extinction burst of um, hypervigilance or more activity than normal, trying to change the environment. And then you might see reduced activity like uh, lethargic animals. You might see weight loss. You might see reduced appetite. You might see poor body condition. You might start seeing um, vomiting or like in snakes regurgitation. You might start seeing um, diarrhea. So there's going to be physiological and health changes, um, either a weight gain or a weight loss. You're going to start seeing things physically happen to that animal if they're experiencing chronic stress. And even things that you can't see, like um, it it can affect the heart and the internal organs stress can. And we all know that because people who experience high uh, uh, chronic stress have a higher incidence of heart disease. And it's not going to be different with an animal, but that may be something as a keeper we might not see. So if you were, um, so there's a difference, like there's a, there. I'm, I'm hearing that there's a difference between an animal adjusting to a stressor, like you were talking about with building resiliency, yes. where they ex- they kind of become accustomed or conditioned to the stressor and then no longer is it a stressor, they've acquiesced. And because then they're exhibiting the same behaviors that they did previous to the introduction of the stressor to an extent versus newer behaviors that might not be positive, like regurgitation and right. excess lethargy body condition. So there's, there's a difference between accepting the stressor and becoming chronically stressed visually and, in a keeper. And behaviorally, and I'm sure physiologically too, but I can't measure, I'm not set up here to do blood draws and routine physiological checks, but behaviorally, there's a difference between seeing an animal exhibit some mild to moderate stress when they first are introduced to something novel or when they don't have something they think they should have right then and where they then return to no stress in that comfort zone. So they're stretched a little bit outside of their comfort zone and they might do a lot of approach and retreat or a lot of, um, you know, maybe circle around into their hide, but they come right back out. So you're going to see that fluctuation between some some mild to moderate stress behaviors, but going back to being relaxed versus severe stress behaviors, which are going to be, I'm so out of my mind stressed. I can't think I can't learn. I'm vomiting. I'm ex- I'm, you know, evacuating my bladder and bowels. I'm just over the top, severely stressed and I'm not returning to my comfort zone. So those are differences. You are going to see some mild to moderate stress any with any change. And that's good as you're trying to build resiliency and trying to get them used to things. But that shouldn't tip over the edge to that severe stress. It should go back to, okay, yeah, I was a little bit stretched out of my comfort zone with that, but now I'm okay with it. And I Thank think you. that's such a good point. If you don't build that resi- resiliency by introducing smaller stressors, eventually something will happen that will push them right over the edge. It's the same as if you overparent a kid, you do everything for them, you protect them, and then they get a flat tire and they go off the wall. They can't handle it, right? It's a small problem for most people, but if you were there solving every problem for them, which brings us back to the greatest hole in the world, if you have theoretically solved every single problem that animal is going to have, No wonder it goes off food when you move it from one tub to another. You just did something that is so much more than it could ever handle that you've sent it over the rails. So Mm -hmm. it's, I think that's a really good point. And Joe, I can tell you have things in your, in your head there. I do. I've got quite a lot, but there's also a fan running out there and it's really annoying me. So I'm just going to turn it off and I'll be back in a second. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Mariah, did you maybe want to jump in while uh, Joe's doing his fan? Uh, I guess this is a good time anyway, because I've got a question for Laurie. Um, 
by the way, speaking of resiliency, um, I plated lizard that uh, I've been working with you on a little bit. Uh, interestingly, she is getting more resilient despite everything. Um, when my husband took her out for handling, which is a big stressor for her, it's probably one of her number one traumas. She's also just not very resilient in general. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with her. Uh, she was back at the watching the world go by at the front of her tank the next day. Uh, I approached. She did not leave. I mean, I, I did not do anything out of the normal, but she wasn't doing anything out of the normal either for her. So the fact that she was not traumatized by that unexpected event is huge. Uh, and that's really awesome to observe. Uh, but I also had a question for you. Is it bad to deny your reptile a behavior when they cue for it? Um, sometimes I just don't have time to yeah. be like, oh, I know you want out of your enclosure, but it's midnight and I shouldn't be awake either. So no. <laughs> That's a great question. And it comes to the point that I try to make with people as I work with them and their animals, that to have the best relationship possible, you want to have a partnership, you know, you want to have dialogue between you and that animal, no matter what species it is, and, and they need to be able to choose to do some things. Um, but that partnership, because they're under captive management, and because we have to ensure their safety and welfare has to be sort of you're the senior partner. It's still a partnership, but I have like 51% of it and you have 49% of it or something. I'm still the senior partner. So I still ultimately make the decisions that are best for your safety and welfare. So if one of my snakes is out exercising and that's always supervised, I don't want anybody to watch this and think she lets snakes just live free in her home. No, they have designated exercise stations and areas. And then sometimes they get to free roam in the house and I follow them. I'm right there with them, following along with them. But sometimes they'll go into an area that isn't safe for them. Like when the snakes are free roaming, the cats have their own room and I close the door. So if the snake's going to go under that door into the room with the cats, that's not optimal for either species. <laughs> so I have to intervene now. And I have to mo physically move that snake or redirect them. And that's technically coercive. That's technically um, force-based handling. I've picked the snake up and I'm forcing them to relocate somewhere else. But that's for their own good. You know, I have to do that in order to ensure their safety and the cat's safety. And so we're always going to have to be that senior partner. And you can't 100% do only choice-based handling because then the animal and the other things that live in the household wouldn't be safe. And so if your animal wants out, and I do have several that want out consistently every single night. I have some that don't. If they want out, I try to accommodate that. And I usually can. But if it's, if it's a night when I can't, then I just can't let them out. They have to stay in their enclosure. And they just have to get over it that night. But maybe I'll try to throw something novel in there to keep them occupied for the night. Like I'll, I'll put a cardboard box in there or I'll scent something with um, an essential oil that's safe or a fruity scent and I'll stick it in there for them to smell for the night. And that might, you know, just take the edge off of their distress a little bit um, because they are often quite distressed when they can't come out and they're used to being able to do that. So you have to make, I mean, it's not a perfect world. Unfortunately, the animals are, are in captivity. You know, there's no bones about it. They're in a cage. And we like to use other terms like enclosure and habitat and living space. And I love those terms more than cage. I hate the term cage. But when you come down to it, it is a cage. And it's just as if you were kept um, in your one room apartment and never allowed to leave. You know, I might give you everything you need in your apartment, but if you're never allowed to choose to walk out the door, you still wouldn't be 100% happy. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the reptiles and some of the other species we keep are in those circumstances. We can't get around that and keep them safe and keep us safe. And so we want to try to provide the choice and the options as much as possible, but there are times when we can't. And that's something that we just have to ethically live with, which is why I've said before, sometimes I can talk myself out of keeping animals that require confinement in cages because it bothers me at times that I have to do that. 
Yeah, when yeah. you're saying that, Lori, it just gets me all concerned about how I keep, you know, like I, I hear it and I get all the feels. All the feels are here. And um, I'm worried because I love the reptiles. And but I picture back to keeping baby skinks that are like two minutes old. And there's no way to teach that little fart that I'm harmless other than to, to actually engage the animal against its will. And it, they're not that quick of learners. And by the time they're ready to go to a new home, they've had to be forcibly moved um, because they're not even potty trained. You know, I can't even get them to litter box. Not that I'm trying, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, and so I think about all these things and I, I worry about those stressors, but I also want to condition them to the life that's reality for them. They're not going back to Australia. Um, mm. Australia wouldn't even let them. And so they're going to be in a life where they're going to engage humans. And so you're right. I, like, so what we want to do is within the framework you're saying is within the reality of this little dude or dudette is going to be doing this. I need to find a way to give them the most empowerment and um, which is within reason for my function as a breeder. So, I mean, I have to move the little fart because he pooed everywhere. So, um, but I can do it in a way that's not just vicious and commandeering. I can try and be as, as accommodating as possible when I do it. Um, I watched Dylan's video where he was trying to give choice space to his bow and Dylan was like, and after 30 minutes, I was like, I'm running out of time. <laughs> yeah, come on, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, oh man, if I did choice based on 150 skinks, I would still be waiting and they'd be dead. <laughs> so, You'd but, starve yourself. <laughs> framework so i appreciate because i want because i know viewers are going to hear this and go you know throw the baby out with the bathwater sometimes and i don't want them to do that i want them to hear the framework of within that because i know you get a lot of backlash Lori, for uh, some of the the ideas that you've presented and they're all they have to be understood it's in context i yeah. I'm not, and i'm still digesting that too because i have the feels it's not in context and I'm a bad keeper because I have to move in, but it's not that it's, I have to remind myself consciously. Sorry to interrupt because it's Joe's turn because it's family. Actually one last question for you, Lord. And then I promise Joe, you will get your turn. <laughs> I'm <growing this. laughs> I want to know, Lori, have you ever observed, and I think this will be very useful for what, uh, for people who are watching this. Um, do you, observe your snakes voluntarily interacting with you as a human versus uh, so cueing when you're around but not cueing when you're not around so recognizing you as their caretaker and even possibly taking it a step further is only interacting with you but not with a different person who's also in the room yes yes absolutely and I'll hear many people say well my snakes will be out but I'll come in the room and turn the light on and they all go into hiding and mine, several of mine do the opposite. I'll peek in the room and the snake will just be resting, lying on a ledge or sitting somewhere. But as soon as I come in the room and turn the light on, they come down to the enclosure door and they start pacing the glass or they start pushing on the door because they know I'm their avenue to getting out, the ones that want out. And I don't want to make it like every snake always wants out. I have some snakes that, that I can leave the door open for hours and they don't come out. But I have many that want out. And so they won't try to get out when no one's in the room. But I come in the room and now they know I'm that avenue and they push on the door and they start behaving like, hey, let me out. Um, I've also seen them behave differently with other people than me. I have one snake in particular that came here as an adult because he was biting people and had some behavioral had raised some behavioral challenges for his prior family. And I've worked with him extensively here. And I've had strangers before the pandemic come to the house. And that snake is like a stranger to me when those people have been in the house. Like, I don't know where that behavior came from. Hypervigilance, different body postures, defensive behavior that I never saw, have seen from him when it's just him and I here. So absolutely, I believe they recognize different people, whether that's visually or by scent or by, I, I don't know, I'm not going to try to figure that out. But yes, there are differences. And then I have occasionally had snakes 
that given the choice to roam around the room or be on an exercise area, choose to come and interact with me instead. And usually that's just crawling around my hair or crawling on my glasses or crawling around on me. Um, and, and I think that's more unusual. Usually it's just, I'm the means to getting out of the enclosure so they can do other things. But I have two in particular that will sometimes choose to engage with me for whatever reason, instead of exploring. So they're all individuals. I see different behavior, even from the same individual given different circumstances and on different nights. You know, our um, super dwarf reticulated python sometimes wants to go his own way and explore. And other times I can't get rid of him. Like he's all over me and I'm trying to do stuff and he won't leave me alone. So they're individuals and their behavior changes also based on their mood. Yeah, and, that, and that's actually the the most annoying part of the the critiques that Lori gets is it's the very unsophisticated analysis of what she's doing. They the the most common thing I'll see is oh this is r- ridiculous. This this lady is treating these snakes like they're kids or you know like a snowflake style thing. And in reality, Lori not only has some of the best abilities to read body language, but also her snakes are, are probably more intelligent than almost everybody else's snakes in the hobby just because of the amount of work that she puts them through. So it's almost like a backwards critique where they think like oh she's doing it's a so it's she's being too soft with them when in reality she's a- exploiting the natural tendencies of these animals and actually making it beyond what they probably would have in the wild so it's really amazing so joe let her rip man <laughs> um right i've got several things to remember here because we've had lots of conversations and i'm and i'm gonna try and not miss anything out of the thought and um, the first thing was a uh, continuing sort of taking a step back from what we've been saying um, for a bit, but jumping back to the um, breeders, like why would you not provide a branch? Why would you not not provide UV? And like the, the the increase in space and so on. And that I think is really understandable because I feel that myself, you know, like I said, let me be at the dragon's enclosure, wish it was bigger. I've got me corn snake in a five by two by two as well, wish it was bigger. I wish everything was bigger. If I could change one thing with all my enclosures, then I would say bigger, and I don't think I don't think I could ever say they're big enough. You know, I, I, I wish you were always big. I wish you were as big as the world. You know, you, you know. Well, maybe that maybe that would be too big, but I don't know. <laughs> but you get the point anyway. But I think um, that whilst that is that is true, and like if you've got an enormous breeding facility set up, you know you. You know, obviously there is a monetary thing, but and a massive one if you've got lots and lots and lots of animals. But I think that what needs to change is that we need to come to terms with the fact that not providing the branch and not providing the UV or not providing the near infrared or not providing the loose substrate or whatever, because of cost or because of space or other limitations i think we need to see that and recognize that it is a it's a it's a problem and it's a very and it's for some people in in certain situations it's a hard thing to get around i think the problem is that people who face those issues who have just like a couple of years ago set up a an enclosure that they thought was good and then they're being told to change it and like they can't now because it's part of the furniture or whatever. I think such people in such situations need to be recognised as not being ideal rather than the people who are in those situations getting defensive and saying, well, no, because I've always kept like this and this works. People need, we need to start seeing that, okay, the best, maybe we could improve our enclosures in this way and that way, and maybe we can't do it. But we have to like sit down and accept that. And when we talk about our enclosures to other people say, listen, I do it like this, but you can do it better than me if you're starting afresh. You know, it, it's it's that thing of do as I say, not as I do, because we're learning so much so often that we can't, we're always going to be wrong in at least one aspect. So let's just, let, let's accept that. Let's try our best to always improve our care. But if we have to accept that there are things that we are doing that are wrong or it's inconvenient to change, then we need to we need to be clear about that rather than 
sugarcoating it and saying, no, we're actually doing the best. Um, then the other thing that was mentioned, moving on from that, um, was uh, the training animals. And um, Laurie was saying about um, having animals that are desensitized to particular things, depending on the situation. So, for example, you might have that animal which you keep an enormously high food drive because you might be re-releasing it into the wild. Not that many of us private keepers are doing that, but it's a decent example. Um, or you might have that animal which is the family pet and you don't want to be opening the enclosure and having your hand eaten every time. You, you're just trying to go and change the water bowl or something. Um, and I wanted to give uh, a couple of my own examples to that, um, to where I sort of... I don't know, maybe it'll help people think about it or whatever. Um, but again, talking about me bearded dragon, um, he's never liked handling. Now, that's that's just a quick off-the-cuff sentence, but I think it's quite, if you think about it, it's quite a big thing to say because how do I know that he doesn't like it? How, how have I quantified that that animal dislikes being held? Well, truth is, I haven't. But I just don't think he does. You know, there's, uh, it's it's just intuition and feeling, but there is something in his behaviour, the way he looks, the way he moves, the way he acts when I pick him up, that I just think he doesn't like it. And whether I'm right or I'm wrong, I think that's the case. Um, but if I want to move me bearded dragon for some reason, then that is automatically a worse situation because that forcing him to move... Is then, a, is then an ordeal. Rather than me, say I wanted to put him in a box or something for some maintenance of his enclosure, putting in a box he wouldn't like. And he also doesn't like being picked up. But what if I could make it more, you know, less uncomfortable for him by having him so that he is perfectly tolerable handling, so that he doesn't dislike it. I'm not saying he has to like it, but he at least has to not, be fearful of it so that that maintenance, that moving can be made less of an ordeal to him. So uh, I think I think this does sort of stray into the idea of like zoo animals, really, where people train like chimpanzees or something to show different parts of the body for examinations. So it's not like a, you have to tranquilize them and something and a vet gets all hands on, all hands on. You know, it's making making the non-natural parts of the animal's life less stressful for it, just for a, a utilitarian way. Um, and then a couple more examples is um, my line day geckos. Um, were, they, they were never shy. When I opened the door of the enclosure, they'd bolt, but you could walk through the room and talk at the loudest volume you liked and they would stay out and bolt and whatever. Um, but then I was doing some lighting upgrades for them. Uh, because the enclosure they're in, which is partly why I'm moving into a much bigger enclosure, is it's just too small to fit the lighting system on properly. So I had to spray of different light, different light, change this one this month, a couple of months, a month later, put a different one on. Oh, it's not quite working. I mean, you know, and keeping changing the lighting for them just because I was being over the enclosure and towering above it because it's not very high up. And then you're plonking something down on there. And then obviously the conditions inside the enclosure are changing. They've they learned to be afraid of me. And now when I walk in the room, or anybody walks in the room, they disappear, they vanish within seconds, which is sad really, because not only are those animals no no longer comfortable in a person's presence, and people are in that room a lot, so it's it's just it's not ideal for them. It's also not ideal for me because I don't like owning an animal that I don't get to see. It's it's upsetting when I used to go in and see them basking and, you know, head shaking at each other and tongue flicking and tail waving and all these interesting behaviours they would do. And now I see nothing because they run and they're afraid of me. So I think that training for situations, you know, as I said with the bearded dragon and with the, the day geckos because fleeing on inside of a human would be a great thing if we were introducing them into the wild. But for a pet, fleeing may be a natural behaviour, but it's definitely not something that we want to 
that it's definitely what in the captive situation is negative. How we quantify that, I don't particularly know, but I think that anybody listening would agree. Um, and then the, the third example of this, I want to give this with me, Chinese leopard snakes or twin spot rat snakes, Salafe by maculata, whatever you want to call them. Um, because they never used to take food from me, from the tongs or anything. They, they would also hide when you went in the room. Um, but they, throughout this year, I've just, just some, I didn't, I haven't done anything special with them. I've just been gentle and quiet and kept trying doing different things until they've got to the point now where they're, um, they're rather the opposite of where they were at the start of the year because now they're too food aggressive. Um, and, you, and you go in with food and they just, they, they are incredibly quick, especially for like I'm used to keeping a corn snake for years. So these are just wow. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there is, there is there a middle ground of we don't want them too shy but we don't want them too food aggressive. And what we, in in one situation, the being food aggressive, like if you're releasing it to the wild or something, the, or perhaps if you were to have a large collection, for example, and you want to get food feeding animals quickly, then and so you want to make sure it's eaten, so you put it in and it takes the food straight off you. Though that might, you might consider that positive behavior, but in my situation, the being food aggressive is not um, particularly good because uh, it's a bit it's a bit disconcerting, really. Even though they're only small snakes, it is a bit. Ah. Um, <laughs> so I suppose what I'm getting at is that I think it really is important that we recognise that positive behaviours in one scenario aren't necessarily positive in another, and this is this is getting down to our own desires really this is this is not looking at the animal anymore this is looking at what's useful for us as keepers um which is sort of not quite where we were aiming for with this and I sort of haven't thought about it like that but it's like there's 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 positive for you and i and there's positive for the animals you might argue that um providing uv is positive for the animals but not positive for the keepers Mm -hmm. you could argue that and i suppose it just it's all things to think about but <sighs> drawing that one to a close i think we need to recognize that it's got to be the animal that comes first because they 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 don't get the choice we we are choosing everything for them we are choosing to own them so we've got we've got to take moral responsibility and give their what is positive for them, the, the, the most important. So again, thinking about the snakes with the food, does the snake have any more benefit from being more or less food aggressive? I don't know particularly, but I definitely have a preference. So then I'll let it outweigh it. But does my monetary loss at providing them UV out, you know, it's, it's a, relatively minor loss but it's a potential great benefit to them so i'm gonna let that i'm gonna let that go way above my preference it's positive to them that is what i'm defining as positive behavior so i'm going to allow them to exhibit it um but that was that and then there was also um an old point about the hunting um and also the sort of mariah was saying like the the cliquey people have kept this species and they form like a subculture and um, some people say release and um, pray and other people say oh no you can't do it um, and I'm again thinking about me day geckos and also thinking about like dart frogs for example people just you know they chuck the fruit flies in or bean weevils or springtails or whatever's on the menu for today and you you stick it in and the animals have a great time running around hunting it and uh, for those animals, you can also like tongue feed, but then there's like other species where it's never hunting is even considered. Like I suppose crested geckos, for example, because lots of people don't even offer those insects. Um, but I do, and I give him the opportunity to hunt and he most certainly does hunt. Um, and then I suppose, I don't really know where I'm heading with that, but it's just sort of, 
there's all these behaviours and if if there's positivity to it, rather than joining that subculture and thinking, okay, well, these people say that I can't throw crickets in with me lap of gecko because they'll eat it, um, but I can throw pinhead crickets in with me dart frogs and they'll go around eating them, um, but the crickets will ignore the potential harm to the frog. You know, maybe step back a bit and exit the subcultures and start looking at the broad picture here that I, I, you know there's there may be benefits there may be pros and cons to the animal of allowing it to exhibit particular behaviors but which do you let outweigh the which which wins um i was i'm thinking about me leopard gecko co i in video again now um i was thinking like we can quantify positives and negatives with most behaviours. So the hunting, like you might have the crickets go nibbling on the animal, but you also give it the opportunity to go sniffing them out and hunting them. And we, we have to do that sort of cost benefit analysis to all of these things. So, you know, don't just look at the care sheet and say, somebody says, this is bad, therefore don't do it. Other people have come to different decisions the the leopard gecko and bearded dragon keepers have decided you mustn't let the insects run around with them but the day gecko and dart frog keepers say that you can mm -hmm. so who's right well they're each right in their own specific parts of their argument but think about them both before you actually just go along with it well, that's sort of the the crux of this whole conversation, right? Is like I'm trying to unpack which behaviors, and I I actually really like the fear of humans as an example because that is a wild behavior that you expect, and in captivity, it's actually not good for them to have that because they could hurt themselves, and then you don't get to interact with them. So, it it's tough to understand where to go from there. But I do I, I think individualize and watching your animals is a, is a key uh, part of that. TC, you're about to jump in there. Oh, Joe is making a great point about the, and and it's it's not always just the black and white of like, well, these keepers can do it. And these keepers, can. I think it has to do a little bit more with the, the skill of the keeper and the development of the individual and their understanding of reading behavior and their understanding of reading the health of their animal. Um, uh, some, so if, if they really don't know, under, if someone doesn't understand what it means when their animals not doing a particular behavior, they might not understand that doing something else could be detrimental to that animal um, versus like if your bearded dragon is dehydrated and stressed um, and showing lethargy and then you throw live crickets in there, um, it might have already gone to a chronic stress phase where it's not going to be interested in hunting because it's in a different stage of, does that make sense? So like a, a, a keeper might not realize, oh, well, my animal's not ready for hunting. It's not at its peak capacity to do this. So do it. So I think there's, there's a, and it's super hard because I think there's a laziness in giving care sheets and I'm not talking about you, Mariah, you're the opposite, uh, mm -hmm. but, but there is a laziness in care giving guidance online where the lowest common denominator for the, the most novice inexperienced individual has become the, across the board standard and it doesn't allow a keeper to develop and grow um in their own skill set and, and like an art of identifying mm -hmm. this animal is ready to go hunting this animal is ready like this animal is at peak health i can expand i can give them loose substrate because they're hydrated versus I mean, I would assume you take in a rescue that's dehydrated and got metabolic bone disease and isn't very functioning you're not going to throw live prey in there for them right away. And you might not put them on live substrate because you know, but somebody else who bought something at a chain pet store who walks in, they might not know. And so it seems like there's this, like you, you hit it right on the head. There's this subculture of bottom denominator is the only denominator and there's mm -hmm. no growth. There's no development of the keeper. And so like, I, I want us to be able to have some sort of like, tiered abilities you know they used to in reptiles magazine they used to talk about different animals as advanced and beginner and you know any animal could be a beginner if you actually have the ability and any animal could be advanced 
<laughs> you don't have the ability. You could be out of your out of your range right off the bat if you don't know anything about it. You've seen those people try to keep their ball python in a in a in a drawer, like literally a drawer, like with your clothes in a drawer um, as a little nest for it, and tried to give it a water bottle, like literally, and it's not drinking. And I've seen that mm-hmm. because they had Seriously. no concept. Oh, it was it, the animal died. Unfortunately, it was. I bet. Oh, that's a surprise. They, they they it lasted about a week um it was a baby too but that's someone has no idea at all and they've anthropomorphized it which um it happens it's no, it's a thing that we do we're people and, and and but that's the levels and so getting that you would never do something like that if you have the experience so i think it's it's unfortunate when we get to our care sheets that we're not talking about growth and not 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 at all talking about reptile files. I'm talking in general, in a forum, you get on there and someone's going to say, don't cohab because it's dangerous. Don't put in substrate because it's bad. When it it's, could be great if you mm-hmm. have the knowledge to read the animal. That's all. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm not taking offense at all because the points that you're bringing up are very valid things that I grapple with daily. It And I have been doing this for years. It's okay who's my target audience? Well, newbies and also people who have been doing this for 20 years, but could stand to improve their husbandry. That's like from a marketing perspective, that's an audience nightmare. Okay. That is so many different people to cater to and arguably impossible. So I have to find this middle ground, uh, where I give a standard for beginners to aspire to. And be like, this is the starting point that you should be at. And everything else that says lower is arguably not acceptable. Like, we need to start you off on a higher level than where we have beginning been beginning in the first place. But I also try to intersperse comments with larger is better. In general, the UV that you're targeting, if you have a solar meter 6.5, is this particular UVI at the basking spot, giving them options for, okay, aside from just do this, which I have to do as an evil of like the basic care sheets that I'm writing up for vet clinics and pet stores or um, the little like starter kit shopping list, I have to keep it rigid, but I'm tr- I have to try to infuse a certain degree of flexibility, a good, better, best concept and a absolutely avoid <laughs> or a... Or, okay, if you feel like moving in that direction, it's can. Or is cohabitation possible with this species? Yes, sometimes. Mm. Like, that's, especially with that question, it depends on the situation. If you're new to this, no. Like, simple answer, no. Complex answer, maybe. <laughs> so it's, it's very valid and a huge struggle whenever you're giving care advice context is enormous and that's one of the things i love about online forums uh in the reptile community if you can find a good forum that's the key here if you can find a good group of uh or community of reptile keepers with that particular species that pushes you toward improvement rather than complacency then that's fantastic because you start seeing examples of advanced keepers keeping their reptiles in these amazing enclosures where they are pushing the boundaries and questioning the preconceptions of how a species should be kept. And that gets you thinking, how are they making that work? And is that something I should also aspire to? And having a, um, the presence of positive mentors in the hobby, I think that they transpire the care guides. That's something that a care sheet or even the best care guide can't do. Having mentors setting the pace and helping everyone get to their level, reaching down is honestly, I think one of our most valuable resources and we need more of them and we need more better uh, forums and groups that people can join Mm -hmm. and actually find a place of growth rather than restriction. Yeah, 
Yeah, a growth of the keeper is incredibly important. That's a major part of the reptile husbandry that we don't think about is the actual individual getting better. So, I, I, Joe, I know you really want to say something, so I'm going to let you take over in a second. But we are hitting the two-hour mark, so we should start starting to wind yeah. this down. Somehow <laughs> we, we are in the two-hour range, so uh, listeners are going to get exhausted. But obviously, we're just scratching the surface here. So, for sure, this is like we got to do part two, part three. So, maybe I'll just kind of let everybody do a final word as we come through. And, Joe, you can... Don't open sure any crazy cans of worms here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, uh, I'll let you, I'll let you go l- ahead. Luckily, I was only just sort of going to agree. Um, I was only <laughs> wanting to say we sort of said this in the uh, in the previous round table with Harvey and Liam. Um, we were talking about like the role of reptile YouTubers, pet tubers or whatever. Um, and sort of leading on from what we said there and what's what Mariah's just said is this idea of um being overly prescriptive so people might come out with a curse sheet or as um people on youtube would a curve video and it like says do this do that you can do this do this do this do this do this don't do this don't do this don't do that somebody watches that one video and thinks oh yeah that's brilliant it's just told me exactly what I need to do. I can get this this reptile, my first reptile, and follow it exactly like this, and I'm going to have no problems because this bloke's just told me that that's what I've got to do. And that, that understandably, very understandably, because that's how I started off looking at curse sheets and YouTube videos, it was the ones that told you precisely how to do things, the ones that you thought were good because it didn't leave you confused. You thought you can do this and you can get the animal and you don't have to worry that you're doing it wrong as long as you follow the instructions. But when we are in such an infant hobby as reptile keeping is, as I have said many times, we need to recognise that there is no right way of doing things yet there are ways which are worse and there are ways which are better but which is the best way we haven't exactly decided yet so when people come out saying that do this do that follow this checklist then it's a place to start and it gives people confidence but i do think that it it is our responsibility to leave people with that growth mindset of as you say tc start off with you can start off with a basic enclosure that's fine but be ready to improve it don't just don't just say like the breeders with the racks oh well i've done it x amount of years so everybody else can do it this way it is it's a it's about forward feet forward thinking reptile keeping as they say and let's keep moving forwards what was that? Covered, the covered wagon and horse-drawn carriages, they actually yeah. uh, were used a hell of a lot longer than vehicles. Um, although they're probably better for the environment, let's not go there. But mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> the argument is, you know, my horse and carriage has been working for 2,000 years. Why should I change it? Yeah. And I was like, mm-hmm. well, because my Ferrari <laughs> is way awesome. I wish I had a Ferrari. I don't. But, Gotta go know, fast. <laughs> Who yeah, at home? Zoom. Who at home uses their VCR still? Let's just put it that way. You got any you VHS go. tapes at home? You got to rewind those damn things. So yes, progression <laughs> is key no matter what domain you're in. And we want to treat the hobby that way. We can't be doing stuff that we've been doing for 30 years. So Lori, do you want to give your wrapping thoughts here? You got to wrap them. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I have Christmas presents. I yeah. Tie sure. the ends when you. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I was talking about it, like dropping some sick beats. Oh. Go Lori. <laughs> oh, wrap. <laughs> I want to make sure that I'm just really clear on a few things that came up. So the first thing is that everybody needs to understand that in order for an animal to live with humans, they have to be taught to do things against their nature. And my example is dogs bite, bark, dig, chew, and mark things with urine. And if they did that according to their nature, we wouldn't want them living with us. And they don't automatically know not to do that. We have to teach them and guide them to learn how to live with people. And reptiles are no different. Reptiles are going to have certain innate behaviors that they do in the wild or that are part of their nature, even if they're captive bred, that aren't going to be well suited to live with a human family. And so we have to train them in the way that's the least intrusive, minimally aversive, to not do those behaviors or to do them when it's appropriate. And we give them appropriate environments to do those in. 
And I want to make it clear that with training, there are things that we train the animals to do, like behaviors that we can train them to do, like exit your enclosure, shift into the shift box, station on this scale, open your mouth and show us your teeth. And then there are those behaviors that we teach them to allow us to do to them. And that would be things like holding in position while we palpate you or give you an injection or while we touch you. And for reptiles, oftentimes just that simple touching behavior is extremely against their nature to allow themselves to be touched. And those are things that we have to gradually teach them to accept. So there's things we train them to do and things we train them to accept. And I also want to make it clear that when I talk about using the least intrusive, most effective methods, that is for the individual at the time. So if I have a snake who needs to go to the vet because they're feeling under the weather and there's no choice, I mean, they need to go to the vet. It's great if I'm working with an animal that's already been trained to voluntarily exit their enclosure and load up into a transport container. But what if my snake's not at that point in their training and they need to go to the vet? Well, then I have to be more invasive and I'm going to have to reach into the enclosure and get them out and force them into a shift box. So I don't want people to think that necessities aren't being taken care of because we can't do it in a, in a very minimally intrusive manner. There's the whole spectrum of what the animals are able to learn and accept, and they're not always going to be in the same spot in their lifetime. And so we may, if we have to evacuate because of an emergency, we aren't going to have time to say you all need to voluntarily shift out of your enclosure into a shift box. No, we're going to have to be forcibly grabbing them out and putting them in whatever and leaving. And I just really feel like it's important to make that clear that when you have the time and the ability to work with the animals slowly through gradual desensitization in the least intrusive, minimally aversive manner possible, that's what I feel we should do but there's going to be emergencies and exigent circumstances where we cannot always do that. And we're just going to have to do what we have to do. You can always revert to force and physical or chemical restraint. You can always fall back on that after you've tried other things. Mm -hmm. And then just the last thing is TC mentioned anthropomorphism, anthropomorphizing animals. And that there's nothing wrong with that as a start to learning about your animal and studying behavior. It's normal for me to see an animal drinking and think, oh, they must be thirsty because I'd be thirsty if I was drinking or that animal um, must be scared because they're hiding. That's normal and there isn't anything wrong with that as a start, but then we have to ask more questions and start employing the scientific method after that point and ask ourselves, okay, I think this animal is playing. I think it's having fun because it's going back and forth across this clothesline. Now, how can I scientifically ask that same question and come to a conclusion as to whether what I think is correct or not? So there isn't anything wrong with being anthropomorphic in the beginning, but that's only the start. You then have to do study behavior and, and, and employ some science to determine if you were right about your initial instincts or not. Very, very good points. Mariah, do you have any last closing words? Yeah. Um, one of my dreams for the future of the reptile hobby is to see single reptile households, much in the same way you see families with a pet dog, with a pet cat. It's just one animal that they dote on. It's a member of the family. They are spoiled rotten with the best that this animal can get. And I'm not talking about, you know, dogs that go to the spa or, you know, cats that wear bows or, you know, like we're not like actually respecting them as animals and treating them as the animal, but also valuing them as a member of the family and wanting the best for them. Um, like a bearded dragon in, I don't know, an eight foot by three foot by six foot enclosure. Why not? Uh, just valuing them and just putting all your resources into this one animal because it is the family pet that's already a norm for other animals that are much more domesticated and have been with humans for a long time but i would like to see this happen with reptiles as well and admittedly i mean that's not me i have a research collection and sometimes i really hate the fact that i 
that a, a reality of the work that I do requires me to have direct experience and prolonged experience with as many different species as possible so that I can advance my understanding of reptiles in captivity and how to better care for them. That's a reality of my job. But if I could go back, like if I could split myself in two somehow and like have another me that wasn't working reptophiles and just keeping reptiles for the joy of it, I would only have one or two that I just put everything into. Um, but the problem when you have a family pet is that anthropomorphism or misinterpretation of their behaviors because you don't understand them. You, in order to give them the best care, you really need to understand them as an individual. Reptiles have a lot in common collectively, but there are also some individual variations. You need to know how reptiles work to begin with. You need to know what's how lizards or snakes or turtles or tortoises work as a baseline. And you need to know what's normal for that species. Because it's really common to see a misinterpretation uh, of behavior like, oh, my reptile is really awful at hunting and climbing, like a leopard gecko. Oh, my leopard gecko can't hunt worth crap. So it always gets a, its food in a bowl and I'm not even going to give it that option. Or my ball python is terrible at climbing, falls every time. It's really having a rough time. So I just don't give it that opportunity. Well, they have the potential for it. And so we need to be mindful of what they have the potential for and what they don't have the potential for and understand that often a reptile is bad at something that they should be able to do simply because they're out of practice. It's like a human, okay? Homo sapiens is designed to be really good at moving on our feet, like running. Okay, I can say right now, I hate running. Okay, I'd rather do a million things. Instead, I do martial arts because that's more enriching for me. <laughs> human enrichment, let's go. But um, we are built to be able to run and do so for long periods of time, just on a strictly physiological level. That is something most of us are supposed to be able to do. We just kind of suck at it because we don't go out and run for a long time every day. So obviously that's a huge generalization, but the point is we need to be mindful of what the animals can do and we need to treat them like the animal and give them opportunities for growth. Absolutely. They need to practice those behaviors. I remember when I first moved my carpet python into an arboreal en enclosure, he could not eat at the top of the canopy. I'd give him, he'd coil the prey, and then he'd drop it. And it took him several months and several feedings to eventually learn how to hold onto the tree and take the prey down. And now he does it without any problem. But if I would, I could have assumed that, oh, he can't eat in the tree if I gave up after the first time. So great point. And then TC, fi final thoughts here. I love it. Yes, we want to be able to so I've, I've kind of kind of gathered everyone's what you've been saying. And at the end of the day, I'm trying to just form my own moving forward here. And I, I, I want to say that we each have our own capacities as keepers and as the animals. The animals have a natural capacity that they've evolved to experience. From They may not be good at everything yet, like Mariah was mentioning, and um, but they have the capacity. And so, and then I have a capacity as a keeper. And I guess really what I want to, come away from this is that I want to want I want to try to provide for the animal everything within their capacity that's also within my capacity and skills um, and I want to try to expand my capacities and I, got, I mean obviously I can't make my snake fly but I want to do fulfill the the capacities that they have and my goal as my own keeper is to try and find as many ways I can fulfill those capacities for the animal as possible within reason, within the context of, of captive management and as a breeder. So I want to take away with it kind of just the phrase of if I can and they do, then I should. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where I want to go with the idea. And then, and, and as a breeder, um, I do want to, I would love to see a single, every, household in america have an animal but uh a reptile but I, I would also like to see more small batch breeding the idea that maybe you can have a pair and breed them because then there's one less set of animals in a in an un, inhumane or, or less than ideal um, circumstance the more pets that are in that are breeding in quality enclosures um in in multiple households it still provides the same volume of people 
or the volume of animals, which then supplies the community and still reaches out. So I would love to see it where it's more, you know, mom and pop and take away yeah. Walmart, if you will. Um, let, let's let the mom and pop breeder uh, expand. And I mean, real small batch, like a pair in a giant mm-hmm. setup. And that's it. And I would love to see that more often. And if we had more of those, we'd have less of need for the big um, stores that are unfortunately crunching things. And so that, my takeaway is if if they can and I'm able, then we should. And that's kind of my takeaway for the behaviors. Uh, yeah. And a greater, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Maya. And a greater diversity of species being bred too. Mm-hmm. People are breeding ball pythons and bearded dragons and leopard geckos because they can or because it's trendy. But like, Guys, there are so many species that are so rare in captivity simply because no one's interested enough in getting them to breed in captivity. But there's a demand for them. And if we can just take the pressure off the wild populations, like wild caught animals are amazing and essential to creating a healthy, sustainable breeding population. But you need to start breeding them in the first place. And so I would just really love to see those small, you know, mom and pop type breeders, but not making more ball pythons or more bearded dragons or red eared sliders in an already saturated market. Let's yeah. get the cooler. Okay, not cooler. Every species is cool for its own reason, but let's get the rarer species going in captivity as well. Yeah, it's almost like that concept. It's maybe having more free range farmers ranching could eventually take over the need to do factory farming, for example. So we only have a few massive factory farms. Maybe we have smaller sizes and we could that could take over that way. And I totally agree. I think if there's anything that moves the hobby forward and progresses, it's conversations like this. So I thank all of you guys for taking... I don't even know what we planned today, but we've gone way over time, probably it's two and a half hours in. So thank you so much for providing all this amazing information and a fantastic conversation. I know the listeners will absolutely enjoy this and I make sure I'll have uh, show notes for everything for you guys in uh, your links to your YouTube pages and whatnot in the links below. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for having us on. Been great. Thanks guys. It's been great. This has been fun. Oh, wow. We did it. That was amazing, guys. Let me stop my uh, other recordings here so before my computer blows up. Now I can relax. <laughs> Woo. Ah, so many topics my- we could talk about doing this again that we didn't even hit today. And that is the end of the episode. Thank you so much for listening. And first off, thank you very much to my guests, Joseph, TC, Lori, and Mariah. Thank you very much for joining me. And honestly, guys, we chatted for, I think, four hours in total, two hours of the podcast, but there was about an hour before and an hour after, even longer, where we just discuss and chat and continue to chat reptile stuff. And I might actually pull some of that stuff out of that, you know, off the air chat and make bonus clips because there's some really good content in there as well. Of course, I'll ask permission before I do that. But anyway, thank you very much for getting to the end of this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it and I hope you can join in on the discussion in the comment section on YouTube. Even if you're listening to this on the podcast, definitely pop over to the YouTube version so you can comment and say your thoughts and as i said to the three guests today after off air i said i want these roundtable discussions to act as a continuing conversation so hopefully each one of the installments of these episodes can be a step forward in herpetoculture and every time we do one of these we can make our way we don't have to rehash old things we can continuously walk down this path so if you have discussions and things that you think that we should cover or you have points that you want us to talk about put that in the comments too because this is all a team effort between us the people on the round table and you guys the listeners thank you very much have a merry merry christmas and i will catch you guys we have one more episode before the end of the year it's a fantastic episode with a professor from west liberty university we'll get into that more next week i will see you then bye-bye